brain section in 1 Samuel. It's where God is going to tell Saul that he's rejected as the king of Israel because of his disobedience. Disobedience to God is a terrible thing. Um, hopefully, as we study, we'll grow into a healthy fear of being disobedient. We don't want to take it lightly. We, this, hopefully, this chapter will instill in us a seriousness of what it means to be disobedient to God. And then also from that, that we'll have a, a, a stirring in us to have a heart that would obey God because he's worthy of it. Uh, verse 1 says, Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came out from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman, or infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25 tells the story of when uh, Israel was traveling through the wilderness, uh, having left Egypt, how the Amalekites, um, kind of a nomadic people, uh, and they were kind of bullies, and they were kind of, they, they were, uh, I don't know, kind of lack, uh, trying to think, think of a term, maybe piratey, you know, they would just sneak up and bully on people and take their stuff. And they came upon and ambushed God's unsuspecting people, the Israelites, and they did this not just to the men, but to all of them, the, the women, the kids, and, and they did that as they were just unprepared, not strong. They weren't militarized yet or anything like that. And they did that. And God promised when that happened that he would bring vengeance on that nation for their cruelty. And so now is the time. And God tells uh, Saul, the king, the commander of God's armies, that he is to go and administer this judgment that God's going to bring on the Amalekites. Um, it's a total and severe punishment. It's an extreme punishment. Um, it's um, a terrible punishment on a cruel people. And that's why it's so extreme. Because we, we, it's hard to read that. It's hard to read both man and woman. It's hard to read an infant and nursing child. It's hard to read that. But we don't, I, we don't need to make any apologies for God. God has the power of life and death over every single person there is. Now, we think it's extreme when it's young, a young person, because we expect their life to go longer. But he always has, uh, he, he's always had that. And, and the reason why this one is particularly extreme, and there's examples in the Bible of this and in history, where there comes a point in a culture that it becomes so rotten, so corrupt, that there is no hope, that there's no hope. It's just down a path of no return, where if you just keep letting generation after generation go, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And sometimes, and God's the only one that can know when this happens. He's the only one that can decide when that point is. But he does decide sometimes. He decides that this culture is, needs to be done in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that liken it to like a rabid dog. Sometimes a dog can get rabies. I don't know how rabies works, so maybe I'm going to say something wrong. But maybe you can cure the dog, but at some point the rabies gets so bad that the only hope is to put the dog down because if you don't, it's going to cause damage. And what good's that? And God has shown in his word that sometimes cultures get that bad. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me. That's scary. That's scary. Our culture is going the wrong way. I'm not talking about our politics. Politics is just part of the culture. I'm talking about the whole culture. The Bible, the, the, the Bible I think it's in Isaiah where God says the whole head is sick. And that's, we're, we're there. And, and so um, 
rather sometimes, like I said, it's hard to read this. It's hard to read that, wow, even the kids, wow. The Bible teaches that the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. Those kids that it's hard to read that, they'll go to heaven. If they didn't, and that culture is that corrupt and that rotten, they're going to grow up and may probably not go to heaven because that's how bad it was. So, yes, it's a judgment on the culture, but it's also, there is a sense of it having mercy to it. God, the Bible says that when we get to heaven, we're going to be singing, just and true are your ways, O God. We're not going to get there and go, that, none of that made sense. You better explain yourself, God. <laughs> we're going to know that was exactly the right thing for him to do. He did exactly what needed to be done. He did it, and it was right. And, and he said, I'm going to use Israel to do this, and Saul's in charge. So that was the command to him as the king of Israel. Verse 4 says, So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. So Saul was definitely at this point a capable military leader. Everyone at this point recognized he is their commander. He didn't have any more, you know, trouble gathering people. Every, there's been enough time, enough experience with him. He knew how to gather the army. He knew how to plan an attack. He knew how to do all that. And so he did that, and he gathered together, and they went to uh, the city of Amalek and ready to attack. Now, Amalek was south of Israel, kind of at the, at the south uh, western side of the Dead Sea, kind of corner of the Dead Sea and then bordering Egypt. Verse 6 says, Then, then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when, when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. The Kenites were the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. And apparently they're not only Jethro, but uh, some of their other people were, were uh, kind, showed some kindness to Israel during the same period of time. And they, they lived in a region that bordered, even kind of crossed over into the Amalekite territory. And so Saul went to them, and Saul, Saul's order isn't to go wipe out anybody in the area, but specifically the Amalekites. So he says to the Kenites, hey, we're just giving you warning. We're about to unload on the Amalekites, so you're going to want to move. And, and so um, you're going to want to get out of the way. We don't, we don't want to kill you, but we're supposed to go take care of these people. And so he gives them warning, and, and they uh, get out of the way. And then verse 7 says, And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Remember, remember the command. Kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. And they didn't do that. And so Saul leads this uh, military attack it was big. It covered a lot of territory. Um, it probably lasted more than a day. It, you know, it probably lasted for a, a little bit of time. And they did mostly what God told them to do. They mostly wiped out the people that they were commanded to. They mostly killed even the animals, but not completely, not totally, out as instructed, which means that Saul didn't obey. They didn't obey, but particularly Saul, because it was his job to make sure this happened. And, and a partial or incomplete obedience is disobedience. It is. And we'll see that because God's going to make it clear that's what he thinks. Obedience is simple. The principle, the idea of it is simple. It means doing what you're told. That's that. That's it. Nothing more to it. That's what obedience means. It's not always easy to obey because sometimes what we're told to do is difficult on a variety of levels. And, but in principle, the idea of obedience is not hard. It's not complicated to understand. 
and, and, and all the way up to verse 7, it looked like that's what was going to happen. It looked like Saul was going to obey. He seemed to be moving toward full intention, full carrying out. He, 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 um, he planned, he gathered, he prepared, he, you know, he even started to obey. He did it, but he didn't do all of it. He didn't do it the whole thing. And so it was disobedience. They kept the best animals. They, 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 um, and, and all, and it says, and everything that was good. And, and it says that they were unwilling to destroy anything good. And, cl and then on top of that, it says they, sp he spared the king. He spared Agag. Now we could probably kind of understand the temptation to spare the animals. Cause that's valuable. That's, you know, it's like, it's like if you went somewhere and you know, you're in a, you're in a war and you go and you, I don't know, have to take out a town and you find all kinds of cool tools and stuff. You're like, oh, I don't throw these away. I've mean, got some tools. It's valuable. And we could kind of understand the strong temptation to keep valuables, even though they were told not to. Doesn't mean it's right, but we can kind of understand that. But what about Agag? Why, why spare this king? I mean, this guy, we'll find out later in the chapter that there's a comment made about him that this guy was a cruel guy as the leader of these people. He was cruel. If the people are cruel, the leader is probably cruel, and, and it says so. So why spare him? Well, maybe, he, maybe Saul thought of him as a trophy. Maybe something like, you know, by having this guy in captivity, he's like showing, look at my might, look at my military prowess, look at how I didn't, I didn't just take the guy out. This guy's my pet now. I'm, you know, he's, he, I have control over him. And, and, and maybe he saw that as being, this is honorable, man. Look at me. They, nobody can mess with us. We even, we don't just kill him. We take him prisoner take that guy prisoner. Maybe, maybe it was that. Or maybe, maybe it showed an attitude in Saul about what the position was king about. All, king was all about. Kings are above everybody. I don't know. The, the Amalekites, yeah, but this guy's the king. And maybe it just had a, it showed like what he thought of himself. Like I'm the king. You can't take out a king. I don't know. It doesn't really say. We don't know. The real issue is the, the heart of the matter is it says that they were unwilling. They weren't willing. They just weren't willing. They, they didn't want to. Neither the, neither the people wanted to nor Saul. They didn't want to kill everything, even though they were told to kill everything. They didn't want to. He particularly didn't want to kill the king, even though he was told to take them all out. And, and really, it wouldn't matter if the people didn't want to as much as it matters if Saul didn't want to, because he's the one that's been given this instruction. And, and he, he, if, even if the people didn't want to, he's the commander. He could have said, no, you, I don't care if you don't want to go do it. And, and, and our first point here is obedience starts in the will to obedience or disobedience. It's a matter of the will first, but you know, and, and you don't even have to want to do the thing that you're supposed to obey. You just have to want to obey. There's a lot of times where we obey because we know it's good to obey. We know it's good, it's, we're supposed to do it, and we don't want to. And, but but you, you have to want to obey. You don't have to want to do the thing, but you have to want to obey if you're going to obey. Peter went fishing one night early in Jesus's ministry and they, it, they fished all night and they didn't catch anything. And then in the morning, Jesus said, Hey, Peter, I want to get in your boat. And he gets in the boat and he goes, put out from the shore a little bit. I'm going to teach from here. So he teaches. And then when he's all done and Peter must be tired because he fished all night. And Jesus said, Hey, put out a little bit and drop your net. And G by this time, Peter's like, Lord, we already did this. I'm a fisherman. We did this. We, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. And then we stayed here for you. But at your word, because you said to, I'll do it. And Peter's demonstrating in that story, I don't want to do this, but I want to obey the Lord. And, and so he did. And that's a good example uh, of what obedience is. Obedience and disobedience begins in the will. We decide with our will. We decide, yes or no. 
I will or I won't obey my Lord. I will or I won't obey King Jesus. And if we're going to obey, again, it doesn't matter if you, you can go into it, but I don't really want to do this. It's okay if you do that. You might want to deal with that at some point, but that's nothing compared to, no, I'm not going to do it. Remember he told another story, he said, he said there were two sons and he said, go work in the field. And the first one said, sir, I go, but he didn't. And the other one said, no, but then he did. And he said, which one obeyed? Had nothing to do with their attitude. It had nothing to do with whether they wanted to or not. Obedience is action. And you, and you have to want to obey if you're going to obey. And if you don't want to, you won't. You won't. Verse 10, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. God told Samuel, I greatly regret that I made Saul king. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? How can God greatly regret? I mean, was he caught off guard because he expected so much more from Saul and didn't realize that this is how it would turn out? Was God shocked at this and had to... Now he's kind of upset because now he has to change his whole plan. No. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows how everything's going to turn out. He knew what Saul would do. He knew Saul would sin this way. But God loved Saul. God loves people. And, 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 he, and even though he knew what would happen, it still pained his heart to watch it happen. I don't know how that works. I'm not God. I don't live with the end result. But that's how God chose himself. Even though he knows what's going to happen, it still breaks his heart when it happens. And, and so it broke his heart. It, he, it grieved him in a sense. The Bible says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. How can we grieve him if he already knows what happens? I don't know. I don't know what already happens, but that's what we know about God. And then it, it also shows that Samuel was grieved. Samuel cared about Saul. Samuel was the mouth that had to go confront this guy every time he did something dumb. And, and it grieved him too. Samuel initially wasn't excited that Saul was, that the people wanted a king, but he came to love Saul. He came to be the mentor to him, and he wanted to see the guy do well. It meant something to everybody. Samuel didn't want Saul to fail. God didn't want Saul to fail. And so Samuel cries out to the Lord all night, and later in verse 35, it says that he mourned for Saul. You know, when you watch a game, a big game, there's always two responses, right? You got the side that's all excited and cheering and all that, and then you got the 49er fans. <laughs> right? I mean, you're... And it, it's not just the players. They were upset. The players, of course, they, they, don't, they don't go into a game like that to lose. They want to win, but then somebody loses. And then not just the players, but the fans. If you're a 49er fan, that was a bummer to watch, right? I mean, you, you didn't want to see that happen. And, and God is... In a weird way, he's, he's a fan of us. He wants us to succeed. And, and, and if you have a heart for God, then you're a fan of people as well. Samuel wanted to see Saul do well. And there's people, like you, you can think of people, I'll bet, as a, as a believer, you can think of people that you just want them to do well. I mean, we want all believers to do well, but particularly somebody you're close to, right? Maybe a new believer, maybe a young believer, maybe somebody who backslid for a while and you're like, they're, it looks like they're turning around, they're getting back on track, and you want to see them do well, and you so want it. And if they don't, it, if they start going the wrong way again, and they know, usually, you know, they almost always know. It just grieves you. And the same is true of you. There's like, you know, people want to see you do well. Disobedience gives, is grieving to the heart of God and to other people. Because it's the wrong direction. It's not what God has in mind. And he can't do what he would do as long as we're going to be disobedient. He can't. He, because he somehow God works through our freedom of will. Somehow he does that. And he won't, he won't work the way he wants to through our disobedience. He'll keep working and it won't be fun. 
He doesn't stop working because we're disobedient. It's just not the way he wanted to and not the way we would probably want to either. And so something else to notice here. Notice that God knew about Saul's disobedience the moment it happened. Nobody had to tell God. Samuel had to be told. Saul had to be told that he was in that he got caught, that he was busted. But God knew because God saw it happened. God didn't need some angel to report to him and go, did you did you? I'm sorry, sir. I have some bad news about your servant, Saul. God knew it. And we need to realize that there's never a point when we're not caught in sin. We're, it, it's known. David knew this because after he repented in Psalm 51, he said, in, I've done this in your sight. I've done, I did this with you watching me, God. And it would be way better to know that before we sin because then we wouldn't as much. That's the whole idea of uh, Covenant Eyes, which is the software that monitors where you go online. If you have trouble looking at stuff you shouldn't be online, get it. Or something like it but but we need to realize that we're caught the moment we disobey it's not if someone says something now I'm caught it's not if somebody points it out and goes hey I know what you did now I'm caught God already knew and 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 uh, it's not do I f oh now I'm caught because I feel bad oh I got I finally got convicted God must know he knew before you were convicted and, and he knows. He sees us disobey before, right in his eyes. And that's why it's good to obey even if nobody else knows that you obey, because God knows. You can get away with lots of stuff before the eyes of people. Some people are really good at sneaking around in their sin, covering their tracks, deleting their browser history, all these types of stuff. But God knows. And it's, and it's good to, re and, and so that's why it's good to obey even if no one else knows, and it's good to repent even before you get caught. If you wait to repent till when you get caught, how do you know it's really repentance? How do you know that? You might just be going, oh man, I'd, I, I might as well limit the, tr the trouble now. It's like you go to court and you, you're already caught, so now you just have to decide, am I going to plea that I actually did it or not, and so that I can minimize the potential for my conviction. But it's good to repent even if you don't get caught, because ultimately our obedience or disobedience, again, is in the sight of God. He knows all about it. Verse 12, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, he set up a monument for himself, and he's gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So Samuel, God told Samuel, what's up? Samuel's job is to go confront and, and so he goes to where Saul is. And when he gets there, they tell him, oh, yeah, he's not here. He's on a victory tour right now. He's out there. He made himself a nice monument and statue celebrating himself and his, his uh, you know, his, uh, all that he's done. And, and uh, he's going around and, you know, he's got a parade going on. He's doing all this kind of stuff. And, and, and the interesting thing is, is right now, Probably the only person that really, really knows how much in trouble he is, is besides God, is Samuel. In fact, what Saul's doing make, could make it look like, you know, this could be like this great um, patriotic celebration, yay Israel, you know, waving the flag and yay our king, because that's what he's making it look like. He's, and, and so at this point, everybody else might be seeing it as a great victory because aside from the fact that he was specifically told to wipe everyone out, they did still have, militarily-wise, they still won. They, they dealt with them. But before God and, and uh, spiritual-wise, this wasn't a victory. This was disobedience. And so God's not fooled. Samuel's not deceived here, but, but he was so proud of himself 
Mission accomplished, Samuel, I did it. You wanna come pat me on the back? And, and, and it's hard to tell, I think it's hard to tell. Maybe you see it differently, but I think it's hard to tell at, at this moment whether he really thought he was truly obedient or if he's just trying to put on a show. I, it, it's hard for me to tell either way. Either way though, really, whether he actually believed that he was obedient to God or he's just put on a show, he's deluded either way. This is delusional either way because <clears throat> if, if he thinks he obeyed, then he's deluded because he didn't obey. And if he thinks that, oh, I'll just act like it's all good, well, then he's deluded that he's going to get away with that. He's deluded either way. And that, that's scary. That's scary that somebody could get themselves to think that that's how it'll all work out. I'll just fool everybody. Nobody will know. If nobody knows, I'm good. That's delusional because of our previous point. God knows. And or if if, uh, you know, that but to, that somebody could be that wrong and people can be that wrong. Obviously, I've been that wrong before. I've been I've been in this exact situation before, you know, where you're like, nobody knows. So I'm all good. And God's going, psh, 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 what's wrong with you? I know. I know. And you're not all good. And disobedience is closely connected to that kind of self-delusion. When, when, especially in the people of God, if you're a child of God, if you're a believer in Jesus, when we disobey and think it's all good, when we sin and don't really repent, what he calls us to repent of, when we don't cut off what he said, cut off, when we don't go do what he's told us to do and then think, Nothing's happening. I'm all good. Or worse, nothing's happening. This is great. God's probably cool with what I've done. And, and, and man, that's just delusional. And then to think that we can call him our God and our Lord and our King and then not oh, do what he says. By definition, those terms all mean he gets to tell me what to do and I'm supposed to do it. That that's... Christianity is about obedience. That's what it's about. It's not the only thing it's about, but that's a huge part of what he is. God. He is sovereign ruler of the universe of all. It's all his. It's all for him. That's why at the end of Jesus prayer that he taught us, he said, for yours is the kingdom. It's this is all your kingdom. Any prayer I pray ultimately falls under that fact he is the king it's for his glory and his power forever and ever and ever and so disobedience is kind of crazy it's we're not thinking straight when we do that but samuel said what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which i hear and saul said they, they brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we utterly destroyed. So Saul's, you know, Samuel walks up. Saul's all high on himself, having his victory prayed, probably about to show him. You want to see the statue I made? It's awesome. Does it look like me? And, and he's telling them all this. And, and, and all of a sudden in the background, there's this, bah, and, and Samuel's like, you, you, did the, you obeyed the command of God, did you? Well, what's that? What's all that noise? And, and where did all that come from? And, 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 and Saul's like, oh, oh, that? Oh, yeah, totally. Let me tell you, you're going to love this. <laughs> we decided, well, the, guy, the, the men did, that... What a shame to throw all this away. Let's, you know, like this, let's keep it and sacrifice it to God. To the Lord, your God. Kind of bringing Samuel into it, because you're, you know, you're a priest, you gotta love that. And, and uh, we just kept the best for that. We destroyed everything else, it's all good. But we kept the best for that. Now, now of course, when he says all that, no explanation as for Agag, because you can't offer Agag as a, a sacrifice. <laughs> But that's, that's his excuse. Uh, 
Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said, speak on. Okay. Well, yeah. What do you got to say? What did God tell you? So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, before you got all big headed, when you were a nobody and knew you were a nobody and were fine with being a nobody, he said, uh, you were, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? Isn't that when, isn't, was it, wasn't it when you were nothing that God were like, yeah, you're going to be the guy that's king. And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? So Samuel can't take it anymore. He tells him, shut up. I don't want to hear any more of this. And he tells him that, and he reminds him where he came from. You were nothing, and God made you the king. And that's true of every single one of us. That's, why, that's another reason why obedience is so important. We were, not, we were less than nothing. And he made us his child. He said, if you trust my son, you will be my child forever. And, 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 and he, said, he reminds him that you were nothing, you were humble, and, and God chose you. And then he said, and God gave you a simple mission. It wasn't hard to understand. Wipe them out. Keep fighting till they're all done. All of them. So why didn't you? Why didn't you obey? Why'd you scoop up? Why'd you go down and go, oh, I want that. I'm going to keep that. Don't you know that God saw this and he says that it's evil what you've done? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. So there again, he's making a distinction between the king and the, the people somehow. But the people took up of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. What's the problem? And, and so Saul's persisting in his story, his excuse. He adds, once again, he adds blame on the people, the people, and, and or... He, it almost seems like he's not really blaming. He's just going, yeah, that's, I mean, so it's, again, it's hard. It's, I, I, it's hard for me to figure out. Is he, does he mean this? Is he, I just don't get it. Is he deluded or what? When we're disobedient, we do get deluded. So who knows? And then, and, and so, but again, all this means as he persists his way, either he's extremely self-deceived about what obedience really means, or else he's just lying. Either way, it's bad. He's the king. It's not good to have a self-deceived king. It's not good to have a lion king. Lion king, sound like I just said. That. <laughs> Either way, Saul is a very important case study for obedience versus disobedience. He treated a very simple in uh, a very simple directive from God as if it were super complicated, as if it was open to interpretation, as if ex many excuses could be made as to why he could get out from having to do it. Now, there are things in the Christian faith that are somewhat open to interpretation, that have kind of complex discussions what is church leadership supposed to look like? What are the end times? How, how is that going to unfold? You know, something really small things like what, what order uh, should the service happen in on Sunday mornings? You know, when do you have community? I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can uh, like have an open discussion about and people got strong opinions and they can be open to that kind of stuff. But again, this whole issue of obedience, it's not complicated this what what he was told was not complicated it didn't need any interpretation it didn't need any you know finessing and all that kind of stuff, or excuses and that's one of the things that happens a, a, a disobedient heart has probably already if not 
they will get onto this, this thing of complicating what's simple. Coming up with all kinds of loopholes. All of a sudden, I'm a lawyer before God. All of a sudden, I'm able to like tell God why... I know it says this, but here's why it's okay. And we bring up things like legalism and all these different things. And we say, it's okay because, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we just complicate what can be so simple. And, and uh, listen, if obedience seems complicated to you, that's where you need to start being worried about yourself. That's where you need to, that needs like raise an alarm in, in your mind. Where every conversation between you and God about what you're doing makes it sound like you are a lawyer before God. Be, be careful. Oh, again, it's simple to obey. What we might have to obey might be difficult in the sense of I have to deny myself in, evil, in, in, able, in order to obey that because that happens all the time. But the instructions themselves are not, not difficult. Somebody hurt you, and God says, I want you to forgive them. And, and you don't even need a specific command for that. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to forgive people 70 times, seven times. We pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive them their sins. We're supposed to obey. And God tells you, that's not hard to understand, but it's difficult to do. So do it. Cutting off what causes you to sin, that's not hard to understand. You have to pay attention a little bit. Oh, every time I start on this path, I end up sinning. Okay, now that you got it figured out, cut it off. And, and then submit to say, I will do what God says. It's simple. And if it's not, be worried. Raise the alarm. Figure out why. What excuses am I making? What argument? What, you know, all that. And... If you've decided to follow Jesus, like we are saying, really decided, I'm surrendering. It's not just songs, it's not just words, but in your heart, then obedience is simple. Verse 22, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. So here now Samuel explains to Saul why what he did is so bad. And it, and it grieves us, uh, it, 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 or it gives us the heart of God about obedience and disobedience. God doesn't just leave it at, God's gracious. He doesn't have to do this, but he doesn't just leave it at, because I said that's why, no explanation. He, Sometimes, sometimes that's what we, you know, you might say to your kids or something. And there's a time because they have to learn how to obey whether they want to or not. Just like we have to learn how to obey whether we want to or not. But God's gracious. And so he also explains why. And, and, he's, and he does this through Samuel by a simple question and with an obvious answer. He says, which one do you think God prefers? Which one do you think God likes better? Given the choice, which would he pick? Do you think God would choose his first choice would be a bloody animal sacrifice does he like it that an animal has to die in our place that they have to be burned up and and all that kind of stuff or does he do you think he likes that or do you think he likes it when his children humbly do what he says just do what he says no blood involved no death necessary just, just honoring him by saying, I call you Lord. I'm going to treat you like your Lord. You tell me what to do. I'll do it. And, and, and Samuel didn't wait for Saul to answer, which is good because it would have been like, Ugh, shut up again. <laughs> we know how we answer when we get like that. So we don't need Saul's answer. And so Samuel gives him the answer. He says to obey. Look, let's just make it simple. To obey is better. Than sacrifice. To heed is better than a burnt ram's fat. God is more interested in obedience than offerings. And uh, Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Uh, Hosea 6.6, 6, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. 
That's God's preference. You know that whole, oh, I'll just ask for forgiveness instead of permission? Don't pull that with God. He will give us forgiveness. He's so gracious. Jesus died for our forgiveness. But don't pull that with God. Don't, I'll, I'll just do whatever I want, and then I'll go ask God to forgive me. You, we don't understand the power of sin to dominate us if that's our tact. And, and so how we need to understand that. God delights in just seeing us listen to him, we read his word in our quiet time. We hear it in a Bible study or in a sermon or somebody just shares it with us. It loves him. It, it, it blesses him. It delights him when we go, I'm going to do that, God. That's what I want to do. I'm going to do that. And, and he, he loves that more than you could come in here and dump a pile of money in the offering bag. You could, you could volunteer six days a week doing this, that, and the other. You know, you could be at every church service that you, you know, seven days a week. We don't have them here, but you go find another church. So you're morning, noon, night, you're at church. You could do all that and all the rest. But what really makes him smile, what really blesses him and, and makes him delight is when we hear his word and we say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. You are worthy of my obedience. You're God. You're the king. You're Lord. And, and so what has he told you to do? Now, there's all kinds of general things in the Bible, commands, love one another. But he talks to us specifically. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And, you, and he tells you, you know he does. I know he does. And, and that's those things, too. Oh, there's no chapter and verse on it. Come on. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, and you know it. Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So Samuel, Samuel's pointing out that Saul's big problem, the big deal is, is, uh, his rebel is that his sin was like rebellion and stubbornness. That's what had a grip on Sam, uh, Saul. And he says, and you know what, Saul? That's as bad as witchcraft. That's as bad as idolatry. It's not a little thing to God when we blow off his commands. We, we like to weigh out sins, and there is a place for that. Some sins kill you faster than others, right? I mean, it's like drugs. You can, you can do one drug, and that it, no, none of these things are good, but if you do other drugs, you'll probably die faster. And sins like that. It's all bad, but some of them are going to destroy quicker. But he still takes this sin extremely seriously. It's not a little thing. We can't just go, well, I'm obedient in all these other things. I don't do drugs. I don't steal from my, I don't cheat on my taxes. It's just this one thing. I mean, I'm like, if you want to grade me on a scale, like I'm like 95%, that's an A. And, and I'm walking with the Lord and everything else. And, and God says, look, what you're doing by being disobedient that's a, you might have, it'd be as bad as practicing witchcraft. That's how God feels about it. That's not how I feel about it. That's how God feels about it. And he's right. Being stubborn, that's as bad as being an idolater to him. And, and none of us would, I hope, don't, none of us would try to justify witchcraft, right? Would we? No, you better not. None of us would try to justify idolatry. If anything, we hide it. We don't want anybody to know about it, but we don't try to justify it. And God says, disobedience like that to me. Don't try to justify it. It's, it's, and, and it's greater, obedience is greater than any religious activity you could try to come up with to try to make it better. And God's the one who ordained the specific religious activity that he compares it to. He's the one that ordained the sacrifices and offerings and he says i just be obedient don't do neat, don't don't pick one over the other but make sure you know that the obedience is even greater than the other one because you have rejected the word of the lord he has also rejected you from being king and so it's such a great sin that 
God says, you're, you're going to be done. You're losing the throne. And the God says there's consequences for our disobedience. I don't know what they are specifically for you or me. He decides, don't find out. <laughs> don't find out. But for Saul, it was like, if you're going to lead my people, no, this isn't, this isn't happening. Verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have trans transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. So when Saul heard his punishment, he finally starts to change his tune a little bit. Isn't that like us sometimes? We, that's why you got to repent before you're, it's announced, because you know you actually are repenting. And, and, and so he, he suddenly stops his story about, I did what God wanted. He finally stopped pushing. It's all good. For the first time, he admitted that what he did was sin. But it's not real repentance. He, he doesn't, there's no contriteness here. There's no sorrow. It's, again, if you wait till the consequences are announced, how do you know you're really sorry? And we don't know. And God knows that he, he's, he, God knows. Because God forgives. And, and so this is more the kind of thing, someone who's busted and finds out what their sentence is. And, and that's what he does. And so he admits without really repenting it. This was, and he pleads for Samuel. Can't we just let everything just be normal? Can't we just let everything go on business as usual? I, said, I admit it, okay? And then verse 26, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected... You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned around to go away. Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. So Saul, Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also, that's interesting, huh? There's people better than us. If we're honest, we know that. <laughs> and also the strength of Israel. I love that name for God. That's the, the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent. So Samuel tried to impress upon Saul who clearly didn't get how serious this is. So he says it again. You're done. You're done. You're losing the throne. And, and when Saul realized that Samuel was serious, he gra desperately grabs onto his robe, and he must have grabbed it really tight because it ripped. And, 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 and Samuel sa uses that as an illustration. That's exactly what's happening with you. God is ripping the kingdom out of your, out of your hands. And he says, you're going to give it to somebody better than you. And that's our little you know, high, uh, foreshadowing, getting us ready for David, King David. And, and, and to drive home... Since Saul was trying so desperately, Samuel said, God is not going to change his mind on this. His mind is made up. He's not changing it for you. You can whine and cry and rip my clothes all you want. God's not changing his mind. God isn't going to suddenly change his standard for what obedience and disobedience is just because we beg him to. It's not that Saul can't be forgiven here. That's not what this is about. Any, we can be forgiven. That's what's so great about being a Christian. We, Jesus, we're forgiven. But God doesn't magically whoosh away every consequence because if he did, we would never learn. We would never learn. And sometimes we learn because of our own having to deal with the consequences. And sometimes he graciously shows us somebody else like Saul and goes, everybody needs to learn from this guy. And that's what this is. And we all need to learn from Saul here. And sometimes God goes, no, that, that's, and we don't know when that's going to be. I don't know when, sometimes God will graciously grant us even a removal from the consequences. I, I know that's happened for me many times. But sometimes he doesn't. And he's the only one that knows when he's going to do that. And so you don't want to find out. Learn from Saul. Uh, and so Saul's stories to teach us verse 30. Then he said, I have sinned yet honor me now, please before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord, your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped 
the Lord. So Saul, Saul really doesn't seem to get it here. He seems more concerned about how he looks in front of everybody else. The, this, this mess, uh, you're going you're gonna to lose the kingdom. Like his only concern is, what are they all going to think of me? Can you just like pretend like everything's good still and honor me before the elders? And, and again, because Samuel loved Saul, he went with him, but he didn't honor him before the elders. He went with him. And, and the act of obedience, man, it's so much more important to actually be obedient than to just appear obedient. It's better to obey when no one in the world sees than to try to make everybody think you're all good with God when you know you're not. It, it, obedience and righteousness is first and foremost unto and before God. People can look at you and for whatever reason, because we don't judge right and we judge harshly and we're judgmental and we like to compare and they can look at your life and you could be completely obedient to God and they're looking at you going like, that guy. And you know what? That's going to happen and so what? That's way better, infinitely better than to know you're not okay and not be right with God because you're in disobedience, but to try to make everybody think you are. That is bad news. There, it's, more, it's very probable that if you're living a life of obedience to God, somebody's not going to think you are at some point, and that's their problem. Be right with God. But Saul, he's just like, I want everybody to think it's all good. Verse 32, then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Or, it's been long enough. They're pro I'm probably okay now. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among them. This gives me the chills. <laughs> And because I just think this is awesome. This is like guy stuff right here. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. One of the damages of disobedience is the, 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 the people of God, are, we're interconnected. In the New Testament, we are called the body of Christ. And, and not everybody does the same thing. Right? The hand can't say it, or I don't remember how it goes, but you can't, if you're not, just because you're not a hand, you can't say to the foot, you're not a body. The foot has a different role and all that kind of stuff. If somebody's disobedient, if the hand isn't doing what he's supposed to do as the hand, somebody else has to pick that slack up. And so it does damage to the whole. That's why it's such a big deal to be obedient. That's one of the reasons. That's why God so wants it. He, he has some in mind for each of us. He has general things that we're all supposed to be doing. Then he gives us gifts and abilities, and, and he tells us what he wants us to do. And so when that doesn't happen, uh, Saul was supposed to wipe them all out. He's the leader. He's supposed to make sure that happens. That's his role. He didn't do it, so Samuel said, well, I'm going to finish the job then. And Samuel, look, that's savage. Samuel's a priest. Samuel is not a warrior. Samuel is, you read that, and you're like, wow, that guy's, he's not a warrior, but he had a mind to do the will of God. And if somebody else wasn't going to do it, he was going to do it. Even if it was outside of his lane, even if it wasn't his normal role. And, and so disobedience makes it so that others have more to do. We got to pick up the slack. Or they got to pick up the slack as of us. And then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So the whole, this whole story is tragic. But this is one of the, another just sad point. One of the things disobedience does is when two people are connected in the Lord, we're connected with many people because of our relationship with God. We're one body. And when, when one of those people decides to go rogue, decides to go rebellious, to, decides to get stubborn, that breaks 
fellowship. It just does. Look, if I'm trying to, if you're trying to walk with God, if I'm trying to walk with God, and I want to, I'm not perfect at it, none of us is, but we're, we have a mind, I'm following the Lord. I've decided to follow Jesus, I'm not turning back. And one of our brothers or sisters starts to backslide. We will do what we can. We will do what we can to try to draw them back in, win them back. We want to do that with love and grace. But if you have a mind, if you are unwilling, we can't change that. And you will go alone. We will keep praying. We will try to reach out. But if you have a mind and an unwillingness to go, I'm walking with the Lord, that will break fellowship. We can't go with you in your backsliding. We can't. It grieves us. It grieved Samuel, but Samuel wasn't going to go with Saul in, his, in the way he was acting. He couldn't. And so for believers in Jesus, this idea of obedience, it's big. It's huge. There's a lot of evangelism today where it's just, hey, come and have receive Jesus and he will make you feel good. And when we, it, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You're saying, Jesus is now in charge of me. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. When you, when you become a believer, you're making, you're not just making a commitment to believe in him. You're making a commitment to submit to him. He is Lord of your life. He gets to tell you what to do. We need to obey. And, and if we say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, but we live in any old way we want, that's a lie. And so if, if you need to repent of any disobedience today, it's possible. You can do it right now. Get it right. And, and if, if you've never become a Christian, well, the very first step is to be obedient to his call to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. That's a call. He's, he's telling you to do that. Believe in my son. Turn from your sins. Make him Lord of your life. Believe him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and this heart of yours that we would obey you. And Lord, we want to help us. Help us to fear disobedience. Help us to fear it. And to fear you to realize, to, to look ahead, the damage and the destruction. Thank you that you save rebels. We've all, we're all disobedient. We came in, that's how we came. You died for sinners. But Lord, now we want to live the right way and, and treat you like what you are. You are Lord and you are King. And we submit. And so we love you, Lord. Bless the rest of our day uh, and our fellowship and our time together in Jesus' name. Amen.